Uh, in the last three decades, we saw the affirmation of ceramics in the field of contemporary art. Today, more than ever, ceramics are receiving new attention from institutions, from critics, and art dealers. This is a global trend and was carried out in paradoxical ways by deconstructing artistic categories. Picasso was a pioneer in this development. In 1943, he said to the photographer Brassai, what is sculpture, what is painting? They always cling to old-fashioned ideas, to outmoded definitions, as if it were not precisely the artist's task to find new ones. Um, so, in the field of ceramics, Picasso initiated this development of deliberately deconstructing artistic categories by making unique and multiple ceramics which are to be considered as artworks because they are related to the context of his art in other disciplines and in a paradoxical way as well as to the context of ceramic tradition. He discovered an authentic medium with specific techniques, functions and meanings and understood how to use or to subvert them for his artistic purposes. That's why in Picasso's ceramics, experimentation, improvisation, and innovation plays a major role. Ceramics are part of his creative process, especially because of an issue concerned him ever since Cubism, the relationship of reality and representation of object and image. As Salvador Haro and myself showed in the exhibition, Picasso, Object and Image, that we curated in 2007 here in Malaga, in this museum, Picasso's ceramics are to be analyzed within a global vision of his art, aiming to reveal their particular significance in the context of his output. As we saw in the talk today, this morning, by Will Gombertz and Claire Le Thomas uh, already, uh, by including materials and ready-made objects, Picasso ensured that his artworks would possess an increased relation to reality and subvert a t uh, traditional art canons. The most famous example is the bull's head, an assemblage of bicycle, handlebars, and saddle dated 1942. Picasso told Brassai that if you only see the bull's head and not the bicycle seat and handlebars that form it, the sculpture would lose some of its impact. In Picasso's ceramics, we'll find similar concepts of the duality of object and image. Concerning the chronology of his ceramics, Picasso was interested in ceramics prior to the development of Cubism. He started working in this media in the early years of the 20th century, having gained his first skills in ceramic technique around 1900, 1906 in Paris, while working with the Spanish ceramicist Paco Durio. Durio initiated Picasso in the basics of this technique and showed him the ceramics of Gauguin in his collection, which inspired Picasso as reflected in the female vases he planned in 1901 and 1902. In a radio interview of November 1961, Picasso said, I made things in 1907 and 1906 with friends, small scale potters in Montmartre. I must have worked at Mete's studio too, but it was Durio who did the ceramics. In 1906, Picasso made in the studio of Paco Durio the glazed ceramic sculptures Tet Dom and Woman Combing Her Hair, which was also being cast in bronze. A preparatory colored crayon drawing in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, made in the same year, 1906, shows that Picasso was not only interested in ceramic sculpture, but also in decorating ceramic vases in the style of Gauguin vases, and similar to those André Mette prepared at that period in his studio in Anières, near Paris, for Matisse, André Derain, and many other Fouffes and Nabi artists. The result of the collaboration between the artist and Mette, known as the École de Anières, was shown at the Salon d'Automne, 1907, in Paris, but there is no item of Picasso recorded. Another somewhat mysterious collaboration is with the Catalan ceramist Josep Llorens Artigas, who worked later with uh, Juan Miró. In the archives of the Picasso Museum in Paris are several letters sent by Artigas to Picasso, 
dated from July 1923, proving that a concrete collaboration between them for cubist ceramic images, a wall of colored tiles, as well as for vases and plates, drawings in support, as you can see on the screen, uh, was envisaged. But it seems that no, uh, none of these projects came to fruition. But in 1929, Picasso painted on two ceramic vases made by ceramist Jean van Dongen with slip and animal colors, animal colors, today in the collection of Musée Picasso in Paris. These examples show that he was already interested very early and several times in the creation of ceramics before his first visit to the Madura pottery run by Suzanne and Georges Ramier in Valoris and an old industrial pottery in the south of France, a few kilometers away from the Côte d'Azur. During his first visit to Madura at the end of July 1946, July first explored the qualities of the materials and modeled three clay figures. A year later, in summer, he returned to Madura and began an intense creative process with the Ramies couples team. The production of Madura consisted in a series of functional plates, vases, and a variety of vessels following in traditional standards. In her personal works, Suzanne Ramier reinterpreted functional objects, placing the emphasis on a balance between plasticity, volume, and outline. Using, so here you see some designs of uh, Suzanne Ramier. Using the faience technique, the clay objects were fired at low temperature, about 980 degrees Celsius, in a traditional monumental kiln that was used up until 1954, fed with pine wood. Towards the end of 1947, a small electric kiln was installed as well, and later a few uh, other electric kilns. So Picasso ceramics are the result of a collaborative work. He never threw the pots on the wheel himself. The rocks were, were either thrown or made in serial molding by Madura staff members. <clears throat> According to Picasso, Jules Agar, the master potter of Madura, you see here on the screen, was the best potter in the world and one of the main reasons why he decided to work with the Madura team. Picasso worked with the artisans of Madura with some interruptions for 25 years, till 1971, at the age of 90. The unique ceramics he produced himself in Valoris are estimated to more than 3,500 items, but the precise number is unknown due to the lack of a catalogue raisonné of Picasso unique, so one-off ceramics. 633 of them had been multiplied in two times of editions authorized by the artist, and Salvador will give more details about this subject. Picasso was so enthusiastic with his ceramic work that he settled in 1948 definitely in Valoris with his family and continued to work every day at the Madura Pottery. In 1955, after moving to Cannes and to the Villa La Californie, Picasso worked less frequently at Madura, preferring to have a box with rough and fired pieces sent to him each week from Valoris, only a few kilometers away. He equipped himself with the materials and tools he needed to work on the roughs supplied by Madura. The works were taken to Valoris by Jean Ramier, Georges Ramier's son. After 1961, when he lived in Mougin, Picasso returned occasionally to Madura. Here you see on the right Jean Ramier with some of the doves of Picasso. So now we, uh, we present the diversity of Picasso ceramics. From summer 1947 on, he used all the ceramic available at the pottery, disorganizing completely Madura's regular production. A huge number of plates are used as supports for painted, incised, or modeled still lives for animals, mostly birds, fish, bulls, or narrative, narrative scenes, such as Arcadian scenes and bullfights. Picasso transformed ceramic vessels and dishes by means of pictorial intervention into subjects of representation, such as fawns' heads. It's just an example. He discovered how to use surface, volume, and even empty space 
at the fundamental components of the ceramic image. There is a semantic or conceptual aspect to many Picasso ceramics when volume or even the void is incorporated into the artistic expression, as for example when the plates are transformed into images of a miniature bullring. Here you have the one of the colored one. Another example is the Provencal Bourrache jug transformed by Picasso only by painting into an elegant woman with child, her head signified by the void between the jug spout and handle. The object transformed into an image has not been modified at all in its potential utilitarian form. Concerning further innovations and methods other than a, on a pictorial level, Picasso used the attributes of a ceramic that signal its original function in a conceptual or, as he put it, in a plastic metaphorical way. Picasso excelled in creating sculpture ceramics by manipulating recently thrown objects. Some doves and standing or kneeling woman vases were made from thrown clay bottles by Jules Agar, which you see in the background, which Picasso then remodeled and adding minimal anatomical details by paint or by modeling or by incisions. This is fundamentally different to the work of a sculpture in that through modeling a functional object, it integrates hollow spaces into the artistic process, the void as an enclosed negative volume. Whereas sculpture is worked from the interior, ceramic vessels, even remodeled and transformed to sculptures, are still structurally defined by the void located in its interior. Other vessels that were only slightly modified yet were rendered unusable because Picasso's action, notably when incising or applying reliefs in plates, or when he perforated jugs, or because vessels were not possible to handle. In 1954, he created the picture with open vase by removing a part of the side so that the yellow colored inside of the jug is visible through the cutout. Due to the shape of the opening in the side that has been created, the observer sees a yellow vase, which however exists only as a virtual image, changing its form dependent on the viewpoint. Here again, Picasso explores the relationship between object and image at a conceptual level due to his integration of positive and negative volume in the creation of an artwork. Here he is applying perhaps other experiences of cubism, such as the permutation of convex volume by a concave volume. These are ceramic vessels where functionality is suggested by shapes or signs, but where the utilitarian function is not real. We are confronted to artworks which are images of a vessel or vessels as images. Or in other words, for Picasso, it is not important that these ceramics are to be used, but that they look like they could be used, an issue of crucial importance for the ceramics Picasso prepared in sketches and preliminary drawings. So now we come to the idea and the form. When he returned to the Madura workshop in late July 1947, a year after his first visit, he took with him a portfolio full of drawings made over the previous year in preparation for his ceramics creations, initially inspired by popular Spanish zoomorphic vessels like the Spanish Botijo with a characteristic circular handle, which you saw on the left below, or antique amphora shapes and moving towards to his more and more audacious own designs. He would produce more of these sketches throughout the summer and autumn 47 as well as in 48 and continued occasional drawings of ceramics forms through to 1953. Um, so here you can see the development from a bull by the intermediary of a woman to the female phone shape and the result on the right side. To date, we know of 70 sheets of preparatory drawing with sketches from this period, and many of them were transposed into three-dimensional works, executed in 
So the, 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 the drawings executed in graphite or Indian ink, they prove that Picasso's ceramics activity was the result of much preparation and is similar to the creative process for his, sculptural, for his sculptures and uh, paintings. Here you can see other examples of 1947 and 1948 below. The, dual, the, du, the duality of these figurative um, works, no, sorry, the sketches show how Picasso modified the form of the vases, thus conferring a semantic role to functional elements through a minimalist system of representation. The body are vases or amphoras, the handles signify arms, or in the case of animal-shaped figures, stand for wings or horns. It's interesting to notice that Picasso sometimes provides technical instructions for assembly. A few circular lines mark out the place where the neck of the waist should be joined with the ovoid body. You can, can see on the, on the left. The duality of these figurative works, halfway between vessel and figure representation, is common to the majority of designs prepared in sketches. In this process of deconstruction and reassembly, of different components of a vessel, of combinations and metamorphoses, the necks and spouts of vases become the beaks, necks, and heads of birds. They result of another cubist method echoing here, consisting in the deconstruction of volumetric models of reality, such as heads, bottles, or music instruments, and reassembling them to form an artwork on its own right. Now concerning the transposition of the drawings. These pieces were all made entirely from parts thrown on the potter's wheel. According to Francois Gillot, who shared his life in that, at that period, Picasso called this type of works structural pots. That is, shapes that were made of traditional utilitarian vessel parts reassembled to create zoomorphic figures. According to Huguet and Jean Ramier, Preparatory drawings were transposed into ceramic works from autumn 1947, prefabricated part by part on the wheel, and then assembled by the team of Madura, Madura supervised by Picasso. He always entrusted their actual making to Jules Agar, who would shape the clay forms, as we saw before. Agar particularly excelled at making the big ovoid shapes constituted by two thrown pots joined together with slip. He threw vases and other types of vessels as well, whose necks, bases, and bodies were partly cut to be fragmented and reassembled to create pre structural pots. After that time, after the time allowed for hardening, the forms were assembled, adjusted to one another, joined with ceramic slip, a process which sometimes made it necessary to cut into the surfaces that were to come into contact. According to Jean Ramier, Picasso assisted the various phases of production and he often intervened with some improvisation. In a second modeling phase by the artist, the form was refined, modeled pieces were used to add arms, horns, or other elements, added at attributes to the body of the transformed vessel. Subsequently, Picasso used slips <clears throat> and, if needed, color oxides and sometimes applied glazes on the ceramic surfaces which needed multiple firings. Between 1947, this is just an example, uh, between 1947 and 61, Picasso made a series of variations in shape and in color design of the unique large bird's ceramics. He made most of the one-off sculptural pots unusable unusable from a practical perspective. Even when they have functional necks and spouts, according to Jean Ramier, most of the pieces are not glazed inside, making them unfit for holding liquids which would be absorbed by the unglazed clay. According to Picasso, ceramic scholar and renowned ceramist Leopold L. Fulham, uh, I quote, in this case, the everlasting art versus craft debate is absolutely an oxymoron. Art deals with the abstract, craft with the corporeal. With Picasso, the vessel becomes an abstraction of itself without losing its specificity. He is erecting three-dimensional images, not wares. 
Besides utilitarian shapes, which reminded him the objects he saw and used in his youth in Spain, such as the Botijo and other popular pottery of France, he know by books and other sources, the most important sources are ceramics of the, Antiquan, of the antique Mediterranean culture, especially Etruscan, ancient Greek and Cypriot votive objects or others used for libations to contain perfume or as funerary urns. All these objects were held at the Louvre Museum in Paris. Picasso had been visiting the museum's various antiquity departments regularly since 1901, and he knew about this kind of pottery from specialty books, like uh, the Encyclopédie Photographique de l'Art, volumes one to three, of which published from 1936 to 1938, are richly illustrated and cover the works of the Louvre collections. So as the two mourner figures you saw, you see on the left. Several of the artist figures in animal or human or hybrid shapes were based on ceramic designs by Cézanne Ramier. So this is concerning the collaboration with the potters, inspired by a zoomorphic shape conserved in the Louvre Museum in Paris, which also uh, illustrated in, the, in this book. The tripod vase, painted in several variants, had been inspired by a composite vessel of the early Bronze Age from Cyprus, which Suzanne Rami copied from a photograph published in the Encyclopédie Photographique de l'Art. She made a sketch after the picture in the book and designed and executed it in a large, larger shape, larger than the original in the Louvre. The application of colored oxides and incisions by Picasso has transformed Suzanne Rami's tripod vase into depictions of Françoise Gillot, her head resting in her hands and her lower arms supported on the elbows. Ceramics or found objects. So we'll conclude with this. In 1950 and later, Picasso used discarded cooking vessels of the Valoris production called pignat and dishware such as pots, pans, and plates made with lower quality clay, uh, or tiles and bricks, fragments of industrial ceramics, as well as broken cooking vessels, even chestnut rotors, roasters, and kiln furniture, objects that were not initially intended to be used for artistic purposes. He went even further by painting on ceramic fragments creating a kind of false archaeologic founts, imitating the, the black and red figure painting of ancient Greece. We will see on the next, yes. On terracotta uh, tiles called Tomet, he painted narrative scenes or transformed them into figurative representations. So they ended up as three-dimensional images halfway between painting and polychrome sculpture. So these work are traditionally always classified as ceramics, which are included in the category of applied arts. But they could in fact rather be considered as transformed found objects or polychrome sculptures. Here a last quote by Leopold Fulham. Picasso the potter was acutely aware that he was entering a distinct artistic space and specificity. His unique conceptual insights and his phenomenal grasp of the positive and negative space inherent in pottery forms set him apart not only from his fine art colleagues, but also from the traditional approach to pottery making. I will pass the words to Salvador. Thank you. Uh, I, will speak, I, I will speak in Spanish, so some of you may need your advice. Bueno, Picasso se encontraba muy a gusto en Madura. Amaba su fragancia y sus balcones provenzales de piedra. Picasso was at ease in, ma in Madura. He loved his fragrance and his provenzal stone balconies, its Roman style wood burning oven, but above all the working atmosphere that surrounded him. The artist had rediscovered the pleasure of teamwork that he longed for in the days of Cubism 
and the simplicity of the artisan's life. In fact, he established a close relationship with the workshop workers, as he had previously done in Murlo's lithography workshop. On the other hand, the portraits of Valéry adored Picasso, celebrated his birthdays, and even offered him gifts, such as this golden turntable for his 75th, 75th birthday. The artist was truly integrated into the ceramics trade. Um, proof of this is that from four, 1948, he made the posters and participated in the annual first of artisan products, which took on a special uh, luster because of the attraction that the great artist had joined the court of local ceramists or local potters. In 1948, he presented his uh, pottery at the Maison de la Panse Francaise in Paris, in Paris, where he himself was in charge of the assembly, and in 1952, he did it again with the potters of Valerie. He also presented his work at the 1955 Cannes International Exhibition at, uh, of Pottery in Cannes, where he showed his work alongside that of artisans from all over the world. We can have an idea of this exhibition and Picasso's presence in them with this video. I used to remember this with sound. Une personnalité nous attirait tout particulièrement, celle de Pablo Picasso. Et en fait, cette exposition a consacré le génie du maître de Valoris. Picasso parcourt longuement les vitrines, commentant chaque pièce. Où qu'il soit, on découvre en lui, dans ses moindres propos, à la faveur de ses moindres gestes, une jeunesse qui pourrait s'appeler sagesse, Sagesse en fonction même de la chouette, chère à Minerve, aperçue tout à l'heure. Les pièces ont été également éditées. Bueno, hablemos un poco sobre la técnica cerámica. Now let's speak about the technique Picasso he used. Picasso showed great interest in knowing in depth the technical secrets and the working methods in pottery. In 1947, he uh, had just arrived in Valori and he visited Los Pits uh, pottery factory in Golf Juan where he was informed, but it was mainly Susan Rami, the head uh, potter at Madura, who was mainly responsible for the artist's initial training, and who acknowledged her tutelage on one of his 1950s pigeons with the dedication for Susan Rami, your pupil Picasso, and also on a 1961 plate. All the techniques used by Picasso were typical of low temperature pottery, which were the ones practiced in the region since Roman times, which excludes techniques that were in fashion among potters, pure, pure, pure potters such as stoneware in porcelain. In reality, the quality of the materials concerned the artist less than remaining in contact with the aesthetics of local production, with the authenticity of the present tradition, which on the other hand awakened in the artist's memories of that of southern Spain. Picasso experimented with a ceramic painting techniques in a very fresh and direct way. He was not satisfied with adapting the techniques proven by tradition to his way of doing things, but revolutionized the usual practice by using very unorthodox resources. What he did not know, he invented as he was going along, thanks to his experience and his extraordinary intuition. De Ramier said that an apprentice who had worked like him would have been immediately fired but that his experiments nevertheless almost always yielded surprising results. Ceramic painting techniques differ substantially from easel painting, so it was necessary for the artist to adapt his creative process. Indeed, ceramic painting involves a number of technical constraints that, far from being a limitation for the artist, opened up new fields of possibilities. The greatest challenge is that the colors in, ceramic, in pottery are not revealed until after firing. That is, the artist works with gray colors that have nothing to do with the shade they will reach after they pass through the kiln. Nor do his mixtures work as one might expect from the counterparts in paint, a real challenge to Picasso's virtuosity from which he always tried to escape. 
breves ejemplos de estas técnicas entre la tradición y la innovación. Let's take a look at some la brief examples of these techniques between tradition and innovation. The Engobe pues technique fascinated Picasso from the beginning. El Engobe no es sino arcilla diluida y It mezclada is con óxido a clay colorantes. diluted with oxides, with coloring oxides, to be applied on the ceramic objects, still fresh, although Picasso often did it on dry, especially after his move to Cannes, when he had batches of pieces brought to his house. According to orthodoxy, these pieces were with this technique must be placed in a second firing to part waterproof them. The artist the slip was covered with a immersion and this highlighted the colors of the slip after uh, firing. He even used color glazes that provided an overall color into the piece. But the most creative use is the one he developed with the partial brush application of these glazes, which allowed him to obtain bright areas contrasting with other matte ones in the same piece. Not only that, but he often applied patinas on these pieces after firing, which darkened only the bare areas of the surface, as they slipped on the waterproofed areas that the artist wiped with a cloth, as we see in the 1948 photograph. Las incisiones son, ele son un elemento de primer Incisions orden. Incisiones son un elemento de primer orden entre los artistas, que a menudo combinó con el encado con el vidriado en un curioso juego dialéctico de adición y de sustracción de material. Las incisiones nos remiten al desgraciado, una técnica antigua consistente en arañar una capa de color para dejar la pieza fuera de la pieza para dejar la pieza fuera de la pieza. Las incisiones son un elemento de consistente en arañar una capa de color para dejar la pieza fuera de la pieza para dejar la pieza fuera de la pieza. Picasso la usó con gran maestría y amplió sus límites naturales. Picasso la usó con gran maestría y expandió sus límites naturales. Así, en la fotografía de Quinn, el artista trabaja en esta fotografía by Quinn, the artist works on a plate completely covered with black slip, which he scratches to recover the white color of the clay and thus obtain a female face. Occasionally, the artist manipulated the fresh clay or included separately modeled and other relief elements. He used oxides or glazing, always exploring new directions. He ventured to use uh, ceramic pastels, color sticks that he applied on dry clay that was fired again with or without a covering. This is a piece in this museum here in Malaga, or he even experimented with lasers. Or with the technique of wax reserves, a procedure by which the artist painted with hot wax on the fired piece to later cover this with enamel or glaze. The fatty quality of the wax prevented the enamel from adhering to this shot. After a second firing, the wax had completely disappeared and with the help of a dark patina, its shape was revealed, as we can see in the vase of the left. Or another option is to add copper oxide to the wax mixture, which made the lines directly dark after the process of firing, and the adjacent enamel areas acquired a greenish tone due to contamination, which allowed him to obtain extraordinary pictorial effects. The artist must have found great similarities within the procedure and that of sugar aquatinting and engraving. Since in both techniques, the objective is to select areas that will not be protected by a cover or by a varnish, respectively, depending on the type of element that we talk about. In fact, many of the plastic or formal findings developed in other artistic domains are reflected in pottery, and vice versa as well. Many resources derived from the technical particularities of pottery can be traced back in the rest of this work. No podemos profundizar en este aspecto que fue tratado en la exposición Picasso Objeto e Imagen. No podemos ir más allá de este aspecto que fue tratado en la exposición Picasso Objeto e Imagen. Pero sí veremos al menos algún ejemplo que demuestra la profunda implicación de la cerámica en el proceso de su obra. Por ejemplo, la alta absorción de la arcilla obligó al artista a aplicar la pintura en trazos cortos de intermitentes y de forma de coma. Este recurso resultó especialmente satisfactorio para los artistas taurinos en el proceso de su obra. Este recurso resultó especialmente satisfactorio. This resource was especially satisfactory for bullfighting themes, as it endowed the images with great tension and dynamism. This type of stroke, derived from the particularity of the pottery technique, was applied by Picasso in many drawings and engravings. The inclusion of false marks in lino gravado. El uso de superficies estriadas para pintar, the inclusion of false frames in lino cuts, the use of striated surfaces or the scratching to reinforce the figures with a kind of skeleton, all have their origin in his activity in pottery. 
Resulta, por lo can tanto, be found in other works. The traditional de neglect of Picasso's uh, pottery in many of the treatises that have been devoted to the artist is striking, pues, en esta cerámica, because in pottery lies, lies some Picasso important keys to understanding Picasso's work. It is necessary, therefore, to establish a single methodological model for analyzing Picasso's work, since all his works, regardless of the technique with which they were created and the specific processes, are part of the same whole, and each piece of the enormous puzzle is essential to understanding the whole. Let's talk now about the editions of Picasso's ceramics and pottery. La mayoría de los platos que se fabricaban en Madura Most of the plates se made at Madura were made by pressing sheets of clay on plaster molds. Picasso's lively genius made him realize that if he manipulated these molds, the, tri the traces he created would also be transferred to the printed plate. Thus, in 1949, he made his first plate print which was formed by many others, including some vases. Although at first his idea was to generate printed motifs on which to paint several unique variations, such, such as the two examples on the left, they soon began to be published as the artist's original work. Graphic ceramics had been invented. Sometimes they were left with the original coloring of the white clay with which they were made, becoming a body of work called white pastes. Other times, editions were also made from models that were colored by the artists so that the artisans of the workshop reproduced the colors on the prints, on the original prints, in a process that was similar to that of the old illuminated engravings. In the sequence of images, we see the process. The clay sheet is placed on the mold and pressure is applied. The stamp and numbering is applied and once removed, it is colored and fired. In this image, we see Suzanne Ramier reproducing the coloring on an original print from Picasso's original. Another mode of edition consistent of what George Ramier calls authentic replicas, which are nothing more than authorized reproductions of the artist's works without a need for a previous print. Many of these pieces were published in a large number of copies, while for others, limited a number of editions were established. Initially, these works were launched on the market under the brand name D'Après Picasso, but they were soon renamed Edition Picasso because the public did not perceive them as legitimate works by the artist. It must be said that Picasso created these works explicitly to be reproduced, with all the necessary adaptations and precautions, but above all, under the clear conception of their multiple character. That is to say, it was the edition that gave them meaning. These editions, says Ramier, were always made in the presence of Picasso's original piece, with the maximum guarantees of fidelity. It is necessary to point out that after the artist's death, these unique pieces were withdrawn from the workshop, and yet editions continued to be made until the 1990s. As a counterpoint, we should point out that, according to George Lamier, Picasso often confused some of these edited pieces with the originals. And we even know through a lamp and a lamp that on some occasion the artist himself had started to paint these reproductions, generating edited pieces from his own hands. Anecdotes aside, what generates more confusion at present is that some of these pieces that were already prepared to make editions are therefore marked as an print original or even edition Picasso, were taken out of the production line by the artist to make unique works, which nevertheless maintain their edition stamp. The absence, well, in other words, this one with the gold is marked as an edition, and there are other cases like that. There are many cases. This generates plenty of confusion in the market, and the lack of a catalogue raisonné makes it even more difficult to catalogue adequately these pieces. It was in 1950 when Picasso authorized Madura to make these editions of some of his creations, although a document was not drawn up until 1967. A total of 633 editions were made from models made by the artists between 1947 and 1971. 
parte de sus allegados Some of those close to him did not take kindly As he understood that those works which after all came from other hands would generate confusion in the market about his authorship This is one of the discussions today However, there were two good reasons for carrying out these editions. On the one hand, it was a compensation to the Ramier for the attention paid to the artist. On the other hand, and this is fundamental, there was Picasso's interest in bringing this up to a wider public, to break with the exclusivity of collectors. The very format of pottery, since it is a object, collaborated in this desire, facilitating a certain intimacy in the access to modern art. But in order to reach ordinary people, it was necessary for the work to be accessible and affordable. Y la vía para lograrlo era la de hecho, al contrario de lo que sucede hoy en día, durante las décadas de los 50, los 60, en fact, contrary to what happens today, during the 50s and 60s, it was possible to buy these editions at quite low prices, fulfilling the artist's will that his work would be present in people's lives. Este planteamiento social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Unión Europea. Esta actividad social de su actividad cerámica viene también a coincidir con el ideario de la Therefore, Leon Musimak hailed Picasso as a worker of earth and fire, or Jacques Cassou wrote, the true Picasso is at ease and reinvigorates his energy in a worker's craft exercise among workers. It was, it was really very determinant to, uh, that some uh, pottery began being published and created in editions as Picasso managed to change the basis of reception of his works from the personal or individualistic to the social or the collective. I'm going to have to skip a part and move into the conclusions because I'm running out of time. In conclusion, we will say that Picasso's in, uh, introduction to popular arts are almost always far from the predicates of applied art. The artist has raised to high aesthetic heights his performances in artistic domains far from the traditional fine arts, especially in pottery. Picasso's interest in pottery was due to three essential reasons. First, from an iconographic point of view, the artist found a source of inspiration and documentation which enriched the iconographic corpus of fine arts and increased its formal and symbolic repertoire. Secondly, from an artistic point of view, Picasso's exploration of pottery techniques was an important way for him to explore new territories, both in terms of new resources and the expressive possibilities they offered him, as well as an escape formula from his own virtuosity and the possible risk of bringing this art closer to the common people. Finally, from a social perspective, it became precisely the way to reach the ordinary people, a way to democratize and this art and incorporate new concepts to the already known and familiar ways of creating. The most avant-garde concepts are combined with the most popular roots, giving rise to an important body of work in which modernity and tradition go absolutely hand in hand. Thank you very much.